Yeah. yeah. So um, it, it, you described Dickinson as having a particular talent. Her, her talent was synthetic. Um, and you also describe her as having a natural capacity for assimilation. Obviously, I mean, not obviously, but it's, it, it's, it's, it seems to me as a reader, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room who've read My Emily Dickinson would agree, that that describes you well. And so it's either Susan Howe happens to have a talent for synthetic thinking and for reading others and passing it out, down through the community, literary historically, as you said, or all poets have latent capacities for that or should. I'm not trying to get you to say a should, but I wonder if this is a Susan Howe, Emily Dickinson thing, or is this just a poetic thing that we ought to, it would be fun to bring out in poets. Well, I Does that mean, make sense? one reason I called the book My Emily Dickinson was because I'm not saying I'm right about Emily Dickinson. I'm just saying this is my Emily Dickinson. Right. So, um, you know, it could be that I'm imposing, uh, I mean, obviously it could be that I'm imposing my whatever, my psyche. You mean it's on possible her. that she's not synthetic yeah, and that she's it's not possible an assimilator? That, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying because I do keep, I do often get accused of being uh, uh, dictatorial or uh, my theory. <laughs> well, you're pretty about open about it. My Emily Dick, it's my Emily Dickens, and you can have <laughs> but, yours. Um, but manuscripts, it, my, right. my, my feelings about her manuscripts are strong. Um, strong, <laughs> but, they're, but they're also they're, um, maybe I'm completely wrong. Well, right. I'm, I'm perfectly willing to say maybe I'm completely wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm just say that this is one way to consider, mm. to consider them. But I do uh, know, I'm sure, because I really have read Dickinson very closely and carefully, particularly in her letters, that she uses other writers constantly and very specifically. I mean, a method of, of quotation. Susan, while we're in the li before we leave the library, um, I want to ask you something about um, your thinking about the library. One of the most, one of the clearest ideas in your work, um, in a lot of the things that we read the last five weeks, the students and I, is the analogy between the wilderness, such as you mm -hmm. see in Thoreau, or um, uh, articulation of sound, form, and time. Uh, and the library, and you make that explicit in some places by describing the wilderness of the library. Uh, I want to quote something that you said at the end of, I believe it's per the personal narrative. True wildness is like true gold. It will bear the trial of Dewey Decimal. I thought that was brilliant. That's a really great line. <laughs> now, Very so good. I think of the trial there as what, what's happening there, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, is that the library is wild, you know, there's Cowan in there, and there's Mangan in there, and, they're wi and Dickinson, and they're wild. And um, even the incredibly ridiculous and arbitrary and capricious Dewey Decimal System can't get the wildness out of it. So that's the trial. But I also think about people like Hope Atherton or, th or you at Lake George dealing with the wilderness and thinking about uh, something that was there prior to the imposition of a human intellectual construct like the Dewey Decimal System. So the analogy, it's not a metaphor, it's, it's really wild. Anyway, do you want to comment on that brilliant line of yours? Well, it's partly, it is absolutely an echo of Jonathan Edwards. Right. And so, uh, and the whole personal narrative is um, written in a, a, a style, a voice, similar to Edwards' personal narrative. In the, in the, it's published in this book. Which, you mean what? Personal narrative. Per, my personal yes. narrative. Yes. I think it's in here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it echoes his personal narrative right. in ways. Right. And so that, it will bear, he probably said somewhere, it will bear the trial of fire or the trial of, right. so I just The trial Dewey of Dewey Decimal, Decimal right. Um, and uh, so anyway, that, that was sort of t supposed to be a uh, very specific echo that mm -hmm. would connect it to trial is a powerful Atherton. word there, yes. and leaving biblical Edwards trial. aside. Yeah, biblical trial. And there's a trial when you approach the Houghton and you're nervous about being not let in, and there's a trial involved in your, you know, needing to approach the manuscripts or uh, entering a space that's almost deliberate, conspiratorially unair conditioned, and it's almost as if they're trying to keep you out of that wildness. <laughs> and uh, so I wonder if. Th 
they're really trying to keep you out or what does it mean to feel that you're on trial when you're trying to discover the wildness? So do, are we really set up, academia or libraries really set up to keep you from fun? Is there really oh, danger no. in that wildness? Um, You've no, used the word I mean, danger. I, I um, let's see, when I was, if you, when I was a small child, my father was a, taught at Harvard, so Widener Library, no women were allowed and children right. weren't allowed and everything. So, you know, it, I think it goes back to waiting at the edge while my father went in mm. to find books. So that it's I a would primal like scene in a way. So it's definitely a primal scene. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, then there was in the Athenaeum Library that we belonged to in Boston. The children's room was separated for the, from the rest of the library, and there was a, a very ri a sort of rickety iron spiral staircase, as I remember, and the floor was glass. Mm. So that was, you know, and all the books were faded Victorian. Um, but as to um, the Sterling Library at Yale, the one I'm used to, part of the architecture, of course, of that, those stacks is Gothic, faux Gothic, and they're very dark and um, very very silent. And um, I, I could do a whole number on the sort of weird, seductive mm. quality of stacks. They're sexy places, too. Mm. You, you know what I mean? They're just, you know, you're, it's a little dangerous up there because there could be a lurking killer. <laughs> you know? uh, but, um, but and they have that kind of musty smell, um, but they're but but they they are of course wood and dark. And, yeah, who, um, who owns the woods? Is who owns the words? Who owns the wood in the stacks? Right, all that is in play. But it it always um, annoys me the way nobody can get into these great unless you're in unless you're a student. Like you can't get in here with, right. without your identification card. Although and, we're relatively open. No, sort of. Well, all you I needed came is a picture. Yeah, but you needed a picture ID, and then you could get into yeah, the open yeah. stacks at Franklin's University. But the, all the different libraries where right. I've taught, there's always a right. problem. Right, and Which then there, there, there has so to there's be a vague, a there's a vague feeling of forbidden. <clears throat> terra incognita and conspiracy to keep you out but then there are idiotic decisions that are made that are actually stupid and preventive such as the Houghton's deciding that n that Emily Dickinson never marked any of the passages she read and that's been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt so we've locked it all up and you can't see it well those are rare books the rare book libraries are not right. set but they're something else again. but you know and readers can't see them which yeah is, I mean which is, yeah oh,